night on the Online Wine Tasting Club. Jamie learns how to tell the time. Okay, what time is it that time? It's 11.30 now. Oh. We find out what on earth this rocket has to do with anything. And Caroline is ready to answer all your questions. So if you have any questions for the very well prepared Caroline, please feel free to put them all in the chat and she will answer each and every question you would like to know. It's time to head to South Africa with the Discovery Series. Well, good evening and welcome to another, I say, another fun-filled episode of the uh, online well, it, wine tasting club. Hopefully it's going to be fun. Well, should be. You're here. So uh, <laughs> Mr. Shirt McGee might join us join us later on, but who knows? Who knows? Yeah, he's, uh, he's got too he's many shirts to choose too from. Too many shirts so. to choose from and he's, he's also set us a challenge. So uh, we'll uh, do that. But today should be a lot of fun. We're doing South Africa, some really cool wines. And what's interesting about this uh, Discovery series See how many wines we've got on the table? Are there six, Jamie? We're, well, count, look, can drink wine, count wine. See, that's why we had to have you over here rather than Alex. So how many? Um, so yeah, so um, hopefully everyone's got their fancy schmancy new packaging that I know we've promised for about 600 years, um, yeah. but it is there now. So, um, you know, any feedback, anything that yeah. you think about that, that it came, um, you know, we know what we've had previously and we think we've got some tougher, more rigid cardboard. There's more wine in the bags as well. So not only not only more number of wines, more choice, more actual wine. Yeah, so, uh, which is perfect to share, but great if you don't want to either. Share. Share. I know we we don't know the concept of sharing. No, that's we? why we have we have we have the bottles purely so you can see the labels. <laughs> um, but so we've got you know we've got some great content today. Um, we ran around the houses and we spoke to a hundred and one winemakers and we then realised that. Oh, we try and do this in an hour. So um, yeah. there will basically be, for those who love us all dearly, up on the, uh, on the, the website and the YouTube at the beginning of next week, there will be interviews with some of the other winemakers as well. So if you love their particular wine, grab a, grab a bottle from the online store and dive in and you can uh, do your own second wine tasting and listen Absolutely. to, you know. We've, the we've... problem is, Jamie, we're all just, we all just love South Africa so much. We, we talked about it for too long with the winemakers, didn't we? Something like that, or drank with the wine. I mean, yeah, talked with it for far too long. Um, but we are talking far too much, so we should probably get wine number one in the glass. So if everyone gets that up and going, we're going to start with the Catherine Marshall Savignon Blanc. So this is, I'll put for you first, you know, because I'm oh, yeah. caring like that today. Are you being gentlemanly, Jamie? Oh, I'm on screen, aren't I? I'm on screen. <laughs> so this, this is, you know, this is bright, it's fresh, it's fruity, it's delightful, it's absolutely amazing. Wow, but, that pops out of the glass. But while we have a, a little sip of this, we can probably go to a video, we've got a little okay. intro to South Africa, and then, you know, if we're going to talk to somebody about this wine in particular, Catherine Marshall Sauvignon Blanc, who do you think we should probably talk to? Bob down the road? Bob down the road, but Bob couldn't make it. So, <laughs> we've got a little interview. Chris had a, a, a chat with uh, Catherine Marshall, so let's uh, go to a video. Back in April, we visited Eastern Europe, which describes itself as the birthplace of wine. Well, tonight, we're visiting the birthplace of humanity itself, South Africa. And boy, does this beautiful country have a lot of history. In fact, it has just so much that we're going to have to limit our little introduction to its winemaking or we would be here all night. But first, for those who haven't been, why should you care about this country? Well, I clearly have a bit of a soft spot for it because it was where, like many others, my wife and I chose to spend our honeymoon, and we had just an incredible adventure. Driving around South Africa, it was hard to compare it to any other country I've ever visited. Virtually every time you rounded a corner or crested a hill, you found a new vista that took your breath away. Of course, the wildlife was every bit as good as you'd expect it to be, but it was the flora that truly blew my mind. Vistas of fine bosch scattered across the landscape with a burst of colour. But what we weren't expecting was how quickly the climate changed. Every time we crossed a ridge or moved just around a mountain as you went around the Cape, 
but in three weeks of moving quite quickly, we barely scratched the surface despite driving more than 2,000 miles. Now, this is a wine tasting, and I've been thoroughly reprimanded by Jamie in the past for talking too much about travel destinations. However, you can probably imagine that wine tasting did make up a pretty significant part of our trip. And while we were in those wineries, a few things really came across strongly. Firstly, what absolutely world-class wines are now being made, especially in South Africa's premium estates. Secondly, what a huge respect there is for the people and the environment, especially when these winemakers are up against frequent drought and fire. But thirdly, the value was off the chart. Astonishing food is par for the course in South Africa. The tradition of the braai, a hardwood-fired barbecue involving lots of spice and heat, is deeply ingrained in South African culture. Pretty much every picnic spot comes with built-in braai grills, and it's that combination of gamey and spicy flavours crossed with the heat that the country experiences that led the way towards producing very ripe, robust wines. And sure enough, South Africa does produce many of those, but there are many cool spots and much subtler, crisper wines. So let's talk about how those traditions came about, and of course, winemaking did arrive with the colonists. Back in the early maritime days, the Cape of Good Hope became the epicentre of the South African wine industry as a port and stop-off point for travellers heading to or from India on the spice route. In the 1650s, the Dutch East India Company founded vineyards to help the sailors fight off scurvy through the vitamins that come in grapes. You see, wine is good for you. Not long after this, the command of the supply station planted thousands of acres of vineyards with well-known grapes like Semillon and Muscat, founding what became the famous Constantia wine estate. If this isn't your first tasting with us, you won't be surprised to hear about the Philotsra pandemic, which in the late 1800s caused immense destruction. The vines had to be replanted with resistant alternatives. As in so much of the world, focus turned to quantity, and grapes like Sanso started to become incredibly popular. However, that backfired, and by the early 1900s there was such a large excess that some producers were pouring wine they couldn't sell into local rivers and streams. Prices crashed, and the government was forced to try to create a cooperative to get back in control. This was called the KWV, and it still exists today. At its peak, it set both the policies and the prices for the entire South African wine industry, and they focused largely on increasing the production of fortified wines. So, with the quality of still wine going down, the wine forced to compete at bargain basement prices, the world very rightly started to protest at the South African government's system of apartheid and blocked wine exports. Without that vital flow of money, the local industry was dying. However, this embargo was part of the vast international pressure that, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, finally brought both sides to the table, and at last the system changed. As well as the obvious social changes, the world's wine market finally opened back up. South African wines began to experience a massive renaissance. With a steep learning curve, many producers in South Africa quickly adopted new technology and started trying better-known international grape varieties like Shiraz, Cabernet Sauvignon and Chardonnay. They also created some of their own by crossing grape varieties. The KWV was reformed into a semi-private business which brought a bit more innovation and, of course, better quality. Likewise, the vineyard owners realised they had to focus on quality rather than quantity in order to compete around the world. And boy, did the winemakers realise that when they did this, they were sitting on a gold mine. Everything grew just so well. Today, production remains concentrated around Cape Town, the other major centres at Constantia, Paal, Stellenbosch and Worcester. But following on from its history, we now move to the story of a very varied climate, because here, the geography has a huge impact. The larger area of the Western Cape has a very different climate to the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa, coming from its location around the tip of the continent. It boasts a Mediterranean climate with warm, dry, sunny summers, well, in our winter, that is, and cool, wet winters with most rain falling from May to August. Harvest happens around January, when there's very little rain, so growers can pick exactly when they feel is best rather than worrying about rain, as happens in much of the rest of the world. Protecting the Cape from unhelpful weather conditions is a condition known as the Cape Doctor, which is a set of ocean currents and winds which protect the vineyards from much of the disease that inflicts modern vineyards, and so much less spraying with chemicals is needed. However, the Cape has suffered awfully in the last few years from drought and bushfires. Many incredible vineyards and wineries were wiped out. 
The currency has crashed, making it more expensive to buy barrels and other vital equipment. And then Covid, of course, has denied the tourist-driven wineries and restaurants their vital income, and the government have made things even worse by banning completely all sales of alcohol, whether locally or internationally. It's been a tough time to be a winemaker, but in times of challenge, opportunities often arise. Tonight, we'll be spending a bit more time talking to the people behind the wines and hearing about how they have adapted to this country and the pressures they've been under. The wines we're tasting tonight are from the coastal and Cape South Coast regions of the Western Cape. The coastal region encompasses Stellenbosch, Paal and Constantia, and Stellenbosch is sometimes referred to as the Napa Valley of South Africa. This is the centre of the country's wine industry, with the best university for winemaking, over 160 wineries and more than 15,000 hectares of vineyards. It's home to some of the country's most iconic and premium wines, but the same vineyards are now under pressure from urbanisation and low prices. Perhaps best known for Cabernet Sauvignon and Bordeaux blends, it does also make wine in a wide variety of styles, with a whole new young generation of winemaker coming through, pushing the boundaries of what can be made. Now the Elgin region makes dramatic introduction to the cooler, more maritime Cape South Coast region, where that climate helps to create bright, fresh, elegant styles. In fact, exactly like we see with wine number one, the Tim Atkin 92-point rated Sauvignon Blanc from Catherine Marshall Wines, and so, we went to speak to the winemaker, Catherine Marshall, to hear all about her story and her humble winemaking beginnings. Hello. Hi, Catherine. How are you? I'm all right on yourself. Yeah, very well, thank you. Very well. Th thanks very much for, for joining me this morning. With regards to um, uh, sort of, uh, your wines, um, uh, sort of generally, what... What's your sort of concept there, both with regards to where you're located and the styles that you're looking to produce? Right, the philosophy is all, all around fruit and freshness, brightness, purity, clean, all of that. And, and the, the region that I've chosen in order to get that is obviously Elgin because it's one of the coolest climates in, in a very hot climate of, of South Africa, mm -hmm. Western Cape. So because of the elevation and the cold nights, I'm able to – absolutely target that. Um, it's critical that I, I have that uh, for the style of wine that I make. So I've chosen the varieties that are, are pretty much um, going to give me that uh, style. So it would be Sauvignon Blanc, obviously, Riesling, which is a firm favorite at the moment, uh, Pinot Noir, without a doubt, needs cold. And then uh, other varieties like Chenna, which um, is dominantly grown in the warmer climates, like we know in the Swatland, I wanted to make a style that was outside of that. And so I've chosen um, Elgin because of its kind of freshness and the mineral textures that I get, which is very kind of nod towards Loire. Mm -hmm. so, so that's kind of the styling of, of the wines. Uh, and, 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 and so Elgin would be the region that I'm, I'm working with to give me that. And um, Sauvignon Blanc clearly is a, is a, a sharp indication of all of that freshness, brightness, fruit, bang for buck, all of that. So all tied up in one glass. What I love about Elgin is that um, the fruit aspect is, is clearly there. There's lots and lots of fruit. And because we can hang our grapes for quite a long time, we can actually evolve those flavors from those grassy pyrazines that you, you see in wines from New Zealand all the way into, into what I call the black currant character, which is really pushing the envelope of uh, fruit direction. Mm -hmm. So it's all about fruit climbing out of the glass. So when you've got the glass on the table standing away from you, you can still actually notice that it's sitting there. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's really what Elgin gives me is, is that really, really, really beautiful um, fresh fruit, lovely uh, pink grapefruit freshness, uh, that kind of citric Finish the, the, the peacock tail of, of um, citrus, which I really enjoy, with the uh, the pomegranate, the pink grapefruit being the main protagonist there in terms of acidity. Great stuff. Take care, Chris. Take care. All righty. Bye. Bye. So that was um, Sauvignon Blanc. And should have been a Sauvignon Blanc it in there. Is, because it was Sauvignon Blanc Day, World Sauvignon Blanc Day, the other day. And um, we had a chance to drink. We've, we've drunk quite a few recently because we did New Zealand. We've also had an Aussie one, which actually we didn't put in the wine news, but it has been banned. So it was called Quickie. And um, it, the, the, 
they had a complaint about the fact that this was slightly implying some kind of, well, I don't know, how would you say it? Quickie. Quickie, yes. I think but it that's... just meant that it had to be drunk quickly. But anyway, that is now no longer banned, so, uh, no longer allowed to be sold. So <laughs> no, no longer banned. No longer banned. On like, my shirt, which is very happily hiding away between your fantastic tasting notes. So I, I, I can see, I can't see it in too much detail here. I do have my phone, but I don't want to look like I'm texting somebody in the background. It's sending notes, but, it's getting um, pri private how, messages. How do you guys think in the chat? Will you, do you want to tell us how you think this compares to a typical Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc that you might find uh, you know, in, in your supermarket? Or, or a wine from Elgin in Scotland. Or because, a wine from Elgin in Scotland. Because they have cool nights too, you know? They do. If they can nail the warm days part next, that will be ah, that's so, so crucial. So the, the global warming thing is helping that, and I'm sure it's there is some wine grown in the in the in the sort of outer Hebrides inside a greenhouse. Though I would I would uh, I would have to add, but that's probably a little far fetched, and that's probably got very little, very little to, to do with South Africa. South Africa. So Catherine Marshall makes great wines. Um, yeah. She's known growers for years and years and years. Can nobody hear me? Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to have to start shouting at Alex. Um, so Catherine Marshall makes fantastic wine. She's been making wine since 1997 as the, the Barefoot Wine Company because everything was kind of trodden by, by feet, yeah. obviously. That's a bit self-explanatory. I didn't really need to say that, did I? Um, but for me, this is, it's bright, it's fresh, it's got elegance, it's got this richness, but it does have this sense of place. And I talk about Sauvignon Blanc a lot like this. It's a grape that really lends itself to coming from different places. That if you taste a Sancerre versus a Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc versus something from California versus something from Chile versus yeah. this, they're all very, very different. Yes, are they light, bright, fresh and things yeah. in common? But there's more things that differentiate them, that you put a lineup of Sauvignon Blancs in, you're going to get more difference, I think, in Sauvignon Blanc mm. than just about any other grape going. Maybe Chenin, maybe... I don't know, it's, what it's else? It's the chameleon of grapes, really, isn't it? It takes on its surroundings a lot more than other things would, like, especially on the red side of things. They're, they're a bit easier. Is it really... It's possible to tell the difference between some of these things, like a Cabernet Sauvignon from Napa and a Cabernet Sauvignon from Bordeaux, but it's getting increasingly harder uh, because they're sort of merging their techniques now and they're all kind of doing the same things. Absolutely, and you, you see a lot of people in the new world, you know, there's people who go after what they're doing, absolutely, but there's a lot of people in the new world who try and go, oh, we're trying to do a XYZ fill in the blank yeah. style, yep. and that makes it a little bit more difficult to do that. But I think it's great wine. There were some fantastic tasting notes in there. Saline, Love Hearts, Love Heart. I, I like the cool tasting notes because sometimes tasting notes can get a little bit boring and wine writers can get. It's it's same old, same old. It's essence of raspberry, toasted vanilla. Oh, it just, it's boring. And it's like, you, you've written this 58 times. So when you see things that are a little bit different, you go, that's great. Yeah. And we've, we've, we've got a chat um, later on on wine number six. So I'm not going to give too much away. But it's just kind of, your wine tasting notes are your own. It, it's not about what anyone else's are, and that's what's really kind of exciting. So we hope you like wine number one, but it's probably time for two and three, isn't it? I think I think it might be, although I've just poured myself a bit more of wine number one because, you know, um, it's really good. I like this a lot. I, 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 I don't know. It's... It's not got some of those... You sometimes get this slightly unappealing character with some Sauvignons uh, that's a little bit like cat wee. And I think that's why a few people have started to go off the really, really cheaper stuff. But this is just just fruity and beautiful and, and really delicious. So I like this. So I'm going to drink this and then you can start telling us about wines two and three. Now, we do have interviews for these... But Muggins here didn't finish editing the video and it was too long. I couldn't it, get it down in time. It's too long. So, <laughs> so if we take... Wine number two, um, I, I was talking to Walker about this. So, um, yeah, so wine, wine number two is a Lubanzi, and, and I got to chat to, to Walker, and he was over in Washington, D.C., and I got a bit excited that he, uh, he lives, well, he was about four blocks away from where I used to live in Washington, D.C., so we talked more about um, what was happening in the States than about the wine for the first 20 minutes of the interview, and then it went on and on and on. But this, this is a really, really cool dog, and this is Lubanzi, and it's named after a wandering dog. Um, because him and his business partner, who's now his business partner, met in Cape Town in South Africa, and they were going on a, a little backpacking wander, and this dog just followed them along on the trip. 100 miles across, you know, across the lands, over six days, and this dog just trotted along. Um, That's he, brilliant. He, he turns around and goes, you know, he, he went South Africa, and within two weeks, he just 
fell in love with it. It's like South Africa romanticizes like no other country in the world is what he said, and you may well agree. I've, I've I, never I, been, I but agree. I think it's just you know I I I don't want to get too carried away with it. Obviously, it's got its challenges, and there are a lot of people who are suffering some you know still the sort of long term effects of this fundamental systemic disadvantage to them and it's awful but it's it's been great to see in the wine communities one of the real places where they've made some big efforts to try to try to give people opportunities because winemaking it's very easy to think of it that if you don't own a dirty great big farm which grows grapes you can't make wine but we can you can these days, and it's not that expensive to get hold of some of the winemaking equipment. I hope. But anyway, so so Lubanzi is based on um, lots of different farmers, lots of different growers, and great partnerships. So this is once again, you see a lot of places like we just Alex just mentioned. They don't own their own grapes. They don't own their own, you know, vineyards. But they work with these farmers, and you know, and as I was talking to Walker, it's. It's agriculture. It's no different to carrots or potatoes or apples. And you know, when we talk to um, Catherine Marshall, if you watch the long interview when we get up, there was a time in South Africa that they were ripping up Sauvignon Blanc because they could get four yeah. times the amount of money for a bucket of apples as they could for a bucket of grapes. So where's the smart money? Yeah, yeah. How about them apples? And they ha they have been still ripping up grapes, and they are still ripping up grapes at, at grape vines at quite an astonishing rate. And the the loss of vineyards, because again, if you can put up a you know something that does tourism, then that's a really good thing that you can do to, to make some more money out of it, or you can build houses. And it's it's uh, we we brushed over it. It's this urbanisation that that land. It's hard to um, picture it. But these vineyards in Stellenbosch and Elgin are so close to Cape Town to, you know, they are right in the prime Oh, they position. are. They're urban wineries, literally. Yeah. They're right there. They're, you know, they're on the outskirts and Stellenbosch is sprawling. Cape Town is sprawling. And the place to go is yeah. over that vineyard. And you get a lot more money for a few houses than you do for a few bunches of grapes. Now, I would love to tell you where I went in Stellenbosch and uh, Elgin and Franschirk, that area. But actually... For the start of it, I was on a horse, <laughs> and so I had no idea where I this was This is why we hope his microphone doesn't work. <laughs> so yeah, I, I was on a horse, and um, later on in the day, frankly, both my wife and I went back to the hotel and went to sleep, and we we just knew we tasted some absolutely fantastic wines, and um, um, and it's in this beautiful landscape. You're you're right beneath the mountain, and uh, it's it, it when the sun's out. It, I don't think there's anywhere prettier than it, apart from Tring. Apart from the Tring industrial estate. the Tring Hills. So, Lubanzi, hundred percent Chenin Blanc, which is South Africa's. Grape, well, steam. white grape, really. Yeah, no locally as Steen. So if you see Steen on a bottle, it's still South Africa, still Chenin. So 100% um, Chenin Blanc, um, but they have a little bit. So a bit techy here, but some of it comes in as a whole bunch. Some of it is de-stem. Some of it is dry farm from bush vines. Some of it comes off trellises. So what that enables to, to do is to create the best of both worlds. So they can get this really, really intense fruit flavor if they want to. They can have this lighter, fruitier, easier going style if they want. And they can do a bit of a bit of everything in the middle. And you know what they want to achieve is just to create really good, bright, fresh, drinkable wine. This sits on the leaves for a little while, which is the, the dead yeast in the bottom of the barrel, and it gives it that little bit of richness. So this is Lubanzi. Absolutely love it. Relatively new winery. Um, and they also make a fantastic red blend. And they also do their wine in cans. Um, but what's interesting is, and once again, it's if, you, if you're a cork dork and you really want to hear, we had a bit of a chat about these corks because it's a little bit different to most corks you get. It's what's called a helix cork. So it's kind of between best of both worlds because it's nice and easy just to seal your bottle back up without having to, you know, force the cork in and this, that, the other. Um, it's a bit more like those sort of port corks. And I, I don't know if people can hear me now. Um, I'm sure Caroline will get some feedback, but I'll try to shout at Jamie very, very carefully. Stop but, looking at my chest. Yeah, and there's lots of different closures and you've got ma uh, sort of little, your little glass stoppers that you can get. And um, those are, th those are, it's all about how much oxygen it lets in, basically. That's the, the real big difference. And then it's practicality, you know, and the emotional side. You love to hear that. And, you know, that symbol signifies the beginning of a nice night, doesn't it? It does indeed. It does indeed. Um, so this is 100% Chenin. 
And then our wine number three is Bonfire. And this is a part of a Bruce Jack's stable of wine. And Bruce Jack is, you know, godfather of uh, almost South Africa wine. You know, loads of things. He's got his hand in loads of different bits and pieces. Um, and, you know, he, he's made a lot of bulk wines in his time. Mm -hmm. But from knowing the people in the bulk wine, a lot of these vineyards, the whole lot just whoo, done, massive, in a tank and done, the end of it. But what he's been able to do is go around to these people and go, okay, great, it's all the, all the big boy stuff, but can I have that bit there and that bit there and that bit there and that bit there and that bit there separately? So he's able to command a phenomenal price for his mm -hmm. wines and can make really, really good stuff. And this is a blend. So we've got a little bit of Chenin Blanc, yep. a little bit of a Roussin, and a little bit of Grenache Blanc. Um, so you've got those Rhone style wines in there which just add richness and texture is a 2018 vintage so it's got a little bit of age on it have we got our poly v up for for everyone else's tasting notes before i i well, give we, all we, the tasting notes we can only do away. it for one wine at a time ah. so um but I, I i i could enter a few a few things for wine number two but um well, it'd be quite have we got wine two open at the moment uh no wine three is on poly wine three. Oh, okay that's fine no they're cool I just think that that Chenin, that so many of the Chenins are a little bit one-dimensional, aren't they? And this has got something a bit more to it. I think across the board, there's a lot of wines in that just entry-level thing. And whether you talk about Chardonnay, Sauvignon, Chenin, whatever, when it's six, seven quid on the supermarket shelf, it does a job. It's cold, it's fresh, it's yeah. linear, but it can be... You've tasted it, it's done. Yeah, but it, it, even at its worst, it's still like a, a good fruit bowl. And, you know, I, I, the, the, the breakfast that you got given when you're out in, in South Africa with all of their local fruits just coming in these plates of, of unbelievably different fruits that would make you start saying, as I start shopping in Whole Foods or whatever, you know. Um, you but, don't, you oh, just go to South Africa for breakfast. I do, yeah, for, to, uh, exactly. And um, it's, uh, I, think, I think that sort of bomb fruit style of wine is really nice but it just got a bit overdone so this is a bit more of a mature uh, grown up version of that isn't it it is it, it's got that little bit of texture out that little bit of richness that you start to think do i just want to drink this or should i have a bite to eat with it yeah um uh, but yeah it's not a lot of the other grapes you know and this is both both, both these wines just um for where they're from we're, we're both from Svartland, which is when you're going a little bit inland um yeah. gets a little bit warmer a little bit riper a little, so you get more of these tropical flavors coming through whereas if you end up a little bit more coastal like elgin is that's yeah. where you get more of those citrusy kind of things and, and Svartland is bone dry it is an astonishing looking place a lot of the vines are grown in these really old gnarly looking bushes which each bud gets cut off and grows out like a finger each year at a time. And they, it looks like a, a, a sort of a claw coming out the ground, doesn't it? And the older the vine gets, the, the you can imagine wandering around just at night and getting a little bit scared that zombies were about to attack. But um, zombies, there you go, wine tasting. I never thought we'd have zombies on this one, but there we are, there we are. Um, so yeah, two, two very... Hmm different wines, but it just shows how Chenin can be, you know, manipulated to be slightly different things. The Lobanzi, they also do it in cans, and I could just be that, you know, have a six pack of that, picnic, done, happy days, and I could go for a wander with my dog and uh, drink a few cans of Lobanzi. And on the other hand, the Bonfire Hill, absolutely delicious. Um, but, you know, the, and we'll, we'll get to the prices towards the end, but the value for money on these wines is silly um you know this is the 2018 vintage there's not much of that left uh no. 2019 they didn't make too much drought oh, really? water. no wow. no whites in 2019 yeah, for bonfire hill that, that all of the headlines um, about cape town at that time there was just a massive water shortage in africa and so if you've got a choice do we stop the people from you know drinking, drinking 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 water water or do we make more wine and yeah so you'll find some of the some of the people who've got really really old vines those roots go down so deep that they can still pull out a little bit of that and they do clever things with capturing dew as well but on the whole <clears throat> most of these guys they have to water them oh absolutely absolutely um but what uh what bruce did say is 2020 he feels is the best vintage of the white wine he's ever made Ooh. so it's on its way apparently apparently okay. it's <laughs> on a boat um but we all know how deliveries are these days so uh going through the Suez canal <laughs> exactly uh but there we are but you know let's get some 
taste notes up and let's see what we're thinking about that. Get your questions in the chat, anything you want to know, anything we've missed, anything you must know. And while you're putting your little tasting notes up and, and enjoying these two wines, and also I know we've put a little bit more wine in the bag. So if we're going too quick or too slow or something like that, shout us and let us know so we can pace it right. But we should probably talk a little bit about what's going on in the wine yeah, world. The wine world. The wine world. Now, you might have been, um, I don't know which one we were starting with. Uh, Let's start with the, uh, the the mystery rocket that was in the intro sequence. And you might think that wine and rockets have absolutely nothing in common, apart from when cork. you get a secondary fermentation and cork, cork. On, the, on the thermal tiles of the shuttle we learned um, in Portugal. But yeah, if you, if you uh, turn a champagne bottle upside down and pop the thing, it'll probably become a rocket. But that's not what we're going, where we're going with this one. In fact, we're going to Bordeaux. I thought we were going to space. That's well, what a rocket does. Space. Bordeaux is going to space, or in fact, it went to space, and so they set all of it, it up. Um, That's a yeah, good way to get rid of it. Yeah, um, um, and um, I, I can't remember which chateau it is now. Petrus. It's Petrus. That's right. That's, so what, I, that's why I'm here for his bit of the wine news, just to tick it along. Quite right. Please quite continue. Right. I'll continue. So um, if people can hear you, you probably know that sending things into space is a fairly expensive exercise, and when they go up there. Oh, sorry. Like, like people have been Googling that. How much are they? Oh, oh, I'd send something to space. Like <laughs> my children after six years of homeschooling. I, 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 the temptation is definitely there on some days. That's anyway, I'm, I'm digressing again. Digressing. digressing. So, back, um, to, back to Petrus in space. So bear in mind, in space. Petrus is one of the top-notch Bordeaux yeah. houses, if anyone's aware of it. And if you've had it, you're a very, very lucky person. And if you happen to have any, please come and share it with us. Yeah, come, come drink with us. Um, so uh, they did an experiment. What they did was they sent a few bottles of this uh, up into space and then they brought them back down and then they got um, a, a set of the top Bordeaux experts, um, literally the people who write the books on it. It's Jane Anster, isn't it? Um, mm. she, uh, she was the one who was lucky enough to taste this wine and um, compare it. So they, they did a side-by-side -side comparison of exactly the same year of Petrus one had gone into space on a rocket and the other had not. And they found out that they tasted different. In fact, it tasted almost like it was a couple of years older. So, one of the bottles was obviously tasted by all these bigwigs and the other one has gone for auction. And do you want to pop into the chat any ideas how much you think that bottle uh, is, is going to be, they, what they estimate that, that it's going to go for? £8.50. £8.50, probably. It's gone to space, second hand now. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. I mean, stuff in space gets radiation damage. There's all sorts of things Dang, that you can have, yeah. Dangerous. But, um, no. If you go to the moon, it's made of cheese, it'd be a good parent. I'll give you a clue. It's a fairly substantial amount for yeah, a yeah. single bottle of so, wine. So, while these numbers come yeah. in, should we talk about the second part of the wine news? Indeed. Because yeah. the second part of the wine news, it's short and sweet. There uh -huh. was a study that says drinking red wine can make you more intelligent. So, could you imagine how ridiculous we'd be if we weren't drinking red wine with you guys every month? <laughs> and that's all I've got to say about that. Well, but, we'll be at least two IQ points uh, higher by the end of this, because we've got three red wines to come, no, so I'll that's be, pretty I'll good. I'll be at 16 then. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, no, was that how many awards? Are there? No. Oh, my goodness. I wasn't going to say it. Anyway, um, so have we, got, have we got any answers and thoughts in the chat? Yes. So we've got, got 50,000, 10,000, 100,000, 75,000, 10,000, 1 million dollars. That's correct. It's the correct answer. It's the right answer. We've got a winner. Answer. Answer. <laughs> got a winner. Well, it's the right answer. There's a line yep. that it, it's not really 1 million dollars for the bottle, is it? No. Because no. it's 1 million dollars for the bottle and you also get an earth bottle. So you get That's a pair. True. It's true. So it's really only 500,000 yeah, pounds yeah. per bottle. Bargain. Um, but we, th we were thinking about this and we thought, hang on. Prices for getting things in space uh, have got a little bit cheaper recently because someone... Sorry, can I just calibrate we thought about this? Well, I thought about yeah, this. Okay. Thanks. So um, somebody came up with the idea that throwing billions of pounds of rockets into the ocean and polluting them uh, was a bad idea and instead they'd try to land it. And that meant that you don't have to pay for a new rocket each time. And so how much do you think it would cost to send that bottle in space now? £2,000. It's actually, he's not that far off. It's about £2,000 per kilogram. So it's probably about three grand. So I sense a new business. Let's start sending wine into space. Well, much cheaper we put it in our little bags. Yeah, no that's true. No, no glass to lift up. So yeah, uh, space wine, next, next project coming from us. I like that idea. I like that idea. So 
any thoughts in chat? Preferences over two versus mm. three. You know, do they do different things? Do we like one? Do you prefer the other? You know. So there, there, there was, I guess it's how many people are commenting, fairly split, but I think probably two just gets it. Two just gets it? Okay. People liked the honey. Yeah. Notes in the wine. It's got this nice richness and, yeah. you know, it's got that kind of like sweet honey kind of thing, whereas wine number three definitely has more of that lazy kind of texture, that almost like chalkiness in there, that Absolutely. yeasty bit. Yeah. Um, but my father-in-law prefers three, so there we go. I have to say, I, I, I loved two. I thought it was absolutely sensational, but now I'm comparing it side by side to three. I think the three might nudge it for me. He's not going to say that at all. I'm an equal opportunities drinker. Equal, equal I love each wine equally. They all, they all have their merits. Oh, yes, but he does have a challenge coming on because... Do I? Well, I, I, I have a challenge for him because... Oh, thanks. I have to say I loved the, the Bordeaux blends when we were over there. I loved, the, I loved the dessert wines. I loved the fortified port-style wines. There were some absolutely amazing ones, and the whites were just brilliant. But the one that I never quite got my head around was Pinotage. Yeah. So I started thinking about some of these heritage grapes of South Africa, the ones which were put in after the phylloxera killed off everything. And that came down to not very many. So what I thought I would do was I would let Caroline and Jamie have a bit of a go at trying to pick some wines and showing what was best and trying to win me back over, frankly. Because the thing about Sanso is that it is a very high-yielding grape, and that's why they've done it, like we've said. But they crossed it with Pinot Noir to give it a bit more resilience against that hot sun, and also to make a lot more of it. You're not very into this, are you? I'm not hugely into it, because... And and the, the, the problem with Pinotage, and we all... Yeah, really, that's OK. No problems with Pinotage. <laughs> you can go away now. Caroline, come here and drink all wine right. with me. OK, I'm going to move over. Put Sher Shirty McGee back behind where he goes. Shall, uh, shall the, the Pinotage real fan move in? Professionals, I, I call it. Yeah. <laughs> Pinotage, professional, interested... No, I'm not even going to try and do an acronym on Pinotage. Right, we're going to put this here. OK. Shout if you can hear us, shout if you can't hear us, and send me a new mic. So, I'm going to talk about, we picked one each. Okay? We did. So, I picked the classic, classic, classic of all, uh, what's other, and I say classic, I think it's what we, we know South African red for being, and it gets some good rap, and it gets some bad rap. And when I first got into wine and talked about South Africa, um, you can pay me for love nor money to drink a Pinotage. But I think about 20 years ago when I was getting into, into wine and first getting into my, my wine career, there wasn't a lot of great South African Pinotage getting exported. Mm. Um, and the stuff that did come over, it was, it was cheap, which was great, but it was a bit burnt tiry and leaf rolly and unscrupulous sales reps would say, that's exactly what it's meant to taste like. It's meant to have this tarry, burnt, acrid kind of flavour. And then so you realised it doesn't. It doesn't. So, Jamie, with Pinotage, I have previously got almost like a medicinally linty kind of... TCP. Don't say TCP. Yeah, yeah sort of th that kind of flavour from it, and, and that's put me off in the past. So, Pinot Pinotage, unfortunately, um, is prone to this disease called leaf roll. Um, right. And, as you can imagine, the leaves roll up and it's not good for them so you can tell this vineyard's got leaf roll um but vineyards are expensive grapes are expensive and you know it, it was a bit rife and there was a lot everywhere um and people just go, oh, just harvest it get on with it. no one yeah. will know no one will know and people were selling off it's this this is this is what the new characteristic the style of pinotage is and that's really not what it's all about so this is this is captage and, you know, they've, they've been making Pinotage for a long, long time. So we're in Stellenbosch here, so we're in one of the warmer parts of South Africa. So you get yeah. this richness, you get this ripeness. Um, and this is, you know, the, the for me, the original South Africans, great. That's what they do, and that's who they are. This is wine number five, by the way, um, because I'm just getting ahead of the game, because I like to talk about what I like to talk about. But um, Okay, so, yeah. so you're going first then. Uh, well, you've I'm, you've I'm, just jumped well, in. I'm not jumping in, I'm just pouring it in the glass. <laughs> but um, if, you've got a, if you've got a better option for classic South African, be my guest. Well, I do, actually. And you've only got one glass, so I don't know which I one have... you're going to choose to drink. Yeah, I know. Well, I'm, um, yeah. Um... You need so, a wine opener as well. Yes, please. Let well, me do that. You, you, you do you that. You tell your story. You're I'll the do a sommelier. Bit of wine. I'm so, something. 
So my wine is a Sanso from South Africa, um, which, as Alex quite rightly said um, a little bit earlier, was the grape that was blended to uh, sort of put together to create Pinotage. Um, the history of Sanso, um, as most grape varieties, comes from France, South France, Languedoc to be exact. Um, and it was brought over to South Africa in the mid 19th century. Um, and for many, many, many years, it was by far the most widely planted uh, red grape variety in South Africa. Um, but it wasn't planted with huge amounts of care. Um, it wasn't massively looked after um, and it kind of created this complete overload of, of Sanso wine that actually wasn't that great quality. Um, and I'm going to be talking about yields with wine number four, um, which are really important when you look at the quality of a wine. So this is a really low yield wine um, uh, from Old Bush um, vines. And Alex, grow up. That is why he's <laughs> back over there. Um, I'm trying to be serious for once. Um, so, yeah, and, and what they do is they've got incredibly low yields with these. So to put it in perspective, these... Um, Great, uh, these vines will produce about six tonnes per hectare. Um, and when you compare that to a much more commercial, branded, um, sourced vineyard in the likes of Australia or California, they might produce about 38 tonnes per hectare. So, so it's, Ten times the amount. Yeah, a lot less. So in all, um, they produce about 60 cases of six of this wine. And I think most of it is in the UK, so we're really lucky to have it tonight. Um, and the reason why low yields for a grape like Sanso is so important is that the harder a vine has to work um, to produce a smaller amount of fruit, the fruit that actually grows on the on the uh, on the vines will be of much more concentrated, higher quality. Um, and with a grape like Sanso, which is lighter in style anyway, um, it has been referred to as the, the Pinot Noir of um, South Africa. Um, if you over yield a vine, um, you're going to dilute um, the quality of the fruit. Absolutely, and I think we, we mentioned we mentioned Sanso coming from the south of France. Yeah, and I think for most people, you don't expect Sanso to be that, do we? No. Like the San, Sanso is is rosé in the south of France, isn't it? You it know, is. your your uh, your whispering angel. I said it quietly. Whispering angel. Uh, but you know those kind of you know the, the the brands in the south of France are looking for these very very light pale pink colours yeah. because Sanso is such a light grape it takes yeah. a lot to extract that and that's why you need to have this yolk, this low yield so you have this intensity of flavour the grapes are smaller because if you have a bigger yield it's more water it's more diluted it's mm -hmm. It's no different to, you know, when you make your, your orange squash, if you put that much in and you just do half a glass of water, you get a much more orangey taste. Yeah. You do it all the way up and Completely. that's what happens if you go for bigger yield, you know, more water, more this. But it does turn into, because you have low yield, it does turn into being a more expensive wine mm -hmm. because let it takes more grapes to make a bottle and because it's Pinot Noir, it's relatively thin-skinned and it's a very easy grape to just grow but it's a very difficult grape to grow and keep the yield tight because it's a bit it like is. a weed. It, it's like mint in your back yeah. garden. It's like, I just need a little bit of mint. Yeah, because it's very, it's very good in heat, so it will be really good in the hotter climates. But I'm, I'm actually just to butt in there. <clears throat> we've had um, one comment, which is that it's really, really low in tannins, and is that a common thing for for so and so? Um, and the other thing is, do you also agree that you can chill this in the summer for those hot days? Yeah. Yes. And yeah, so um, people have not been hearing Alex, so I'll just dive in on the question again, just in case people didn't hear. Um, but it's about the, the, low, the low tannins on this. Yes, it's very light, it's very smooth, and that's because it's a thin skin grape. Absolutely, and, and tannin, all the tannin and Tannin structure. comes from skin and pip, so if you've got less skin, less in, you're going to have less tannin. And chilled in the summer, yeah, 
It's like it's fresh, it's Pinot Noir, it's Beaujolais-esque, almost. Well, I think, and this goes back to the point about Sanso historically being really good for rosé in the south of France. And interestingly, there's very little rosé at all from South Africa. Um, so, But, um, but rosé is chilled and it creates that style of wine. So I think if you... Um, sort of think of this as a is a really good heavy heavier style rosé sometimes in the summer, then it absolutely lends itself to a bit of chilling. Mm. And I think food wise, food wise, it's so um, versatile. You know, yeah. you can have this by itself chilled in the garden. It can go with you know lighter dishes. This with this with a charcuterie board chilled would be. But I'm, Something magic. and I know this is my wine, and so I'm always yeah. Gonna but this is the big positive about this. Yeah, yeah. This but, wine, this wine's just okay. It's it's all right. I mean, it, it's the best sinso you're going to drink in a South African tasting this evening. I mean, some people say say rosé as if it's not a good thing. I think there are some amazing star rosés out there. I'm a, I'm a big rosé fan. Um, Jamie has it with turkey, for example, and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag rosé all day. So it, it, that's not a negative for me. And and actually, when what I'm getting from this is a huge amount of complexity, a beautiful sort of perfumey, violety um, aroma, um, almost rose sometimes. Some people say that Sanso can be a little bit like Turkish delight, you know, that sort of rosy, perfumed um, characteristic. But there's a real complexity without Ooh, cinnamon. Um, I like, I like lots cinnamon on of that. Yes. chewiness that you get from the bigger structured tanniny wines. So I think um, it's a really interesting lighter red. And just because it's lighter doesn't mean it's not good because you can still have a lot of complexity in a lighter style. Can we talk about pinotage now? No. No, okay. No, because right. I like Sanso. I've, I've, I've got one more Sanso thing to add. You also find a lot of this, it's um, a blending grape in Chateau Neuf de Pap. It so is. Outside of, oh, Grenache, got... outside of Grenache, Syrah and Mourvedre, which are the three big ones you hear of. Sanso, when you get a really like perfumey Cote de Rhone or Chateau Neuf de Pap, it's probably because they've chucked a little bit of Sanso in the back yeah, end of it. absolutely. That Can I just say my other interesting point? Oh my God, I brought it back in. <laughs> so Does someone on... want to call me when I'm allowed to talk again? <laughs> Well, you asked me to do it. Um, so, Sanso ha was previously known in South Africa as Hermitage, um, which was a nod to um, its roots um, in France. But weirdly, um, Crow's Hermitage, which it was named after, is in Northern Rhone. And there is no Sanso grown in Northern Rhone. It's more in the South, like Jamie said. It's one of the allowed ingredients in uh, Chateau Neuf de Pap. So I'm not quite not quite sure what, what, why Hermitage came about, but that if you've heard of the, the term Hermitage, that's why it was a previous name for Sanso. Hmm. Hermitage. Hermitage kind of travelled the world, that, that phrase, and you had a lot of things trying to... We'll, we'll get a bit off-piste here, but hey, it's... Uh... New packs, loads of wine, happy days, yeah. South Africa. So Hermitage was a place, is a, is a place, and they grow Syrah or Shiraz, and that's, yeah. what, that's what they grow there. But that came out of South Africa, and then when, when it first went over to Australia, you know, you look at the really kind of like the big prestigious houses in Australia, um, their, their top levels in the mid-80s, they were naming Hermitage, like Grange 1986 was called Hermitage. Um, yes. And then it kind of got banned because it wasn't from Hermitage, like... Mm. Cornish pasties or yeah. whatever else. Palm ham. Um, but we've seen, seen those things kind of move around. But it, it just shows that, that that place had such a level of gravitas that people were, oh, I, I can yeah. sell my wine if I call it that. Um, but anyway, we're going on to taste notes for wine number five now, aren't we? Um, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to try the, the pinotage now. Okay, Al Al Alex is going to have the pinotage now, everybody, so everyone can have the pinotage because uh, Alex, yeah, Alex says so. Alex says so. Can, any, can anyone hear him or is it still his shirt's too loud? Um, <laughs> Anyway, well, let's go. Let's go back to to, to real things. So, pinotage. I used this. to I used to love to hate on pinotage. I was just okay. like, why 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 would you even bother? You take Sanso, which is a great grape. You take Pinot Noir, which is a great grape, and you hybrid it, and you ruin two good grapes. But that's because I was only given the crap. I never tasted good stuff. Okay, that's not like any pinotage. I've smelt in quite a long time. That you go, if you've only had the entry level pinotage, and you go, that's not pinotage, that's Bordeaux. That That's very different. That's somewhere that Bordeaux meets Rioja because it's got that vanilla it's got this yeah. deep rich spice, it's got this powerfulness about it. 
And this is, you know, when you talk about these South African cookouts, the brais, oh, this is what brilliant. you need. Bottle of pinotage, roasted lamb, roasted up whatever you're roasting over. They, they roast most things over there, don't they? Yeah, emus, antelopes. Exactly. So this with, you know, <coughs> like those, those gamey kind of things, this richness. Would I sit and drink three glasses by myself? Yes, because it's me. But would the average person <laughs> sit and drink three glasses by itself? No, because it's got this. Are you paradigm. trying to get more intelligent? Exactly. <laughs> How much do I need for an extra IQ point? Because this is at like fourteen and a half percent. It's fourteen percent alcohol. I'm going to be. I'm going that show. Are you smarter than a five year old or ten year old? Well, I'll start with five year old and go from there. But this has got cherry rich dark fruits it's got this spice and you know it's not particularly old but you're starting to see these tertiary developmental characters so you're starting to see a little bit of leather a little bit of tobacco and this is great because you can drink it right now and it's powerful but if you wanted to hang on to this for three five years you'd get it more would of those... last that long would it i think so and you you get more of those tertiary characteristics does it mean it's going to be better it depends on what you like if you mm. want this bold fruity upfront characteristic drink it now but if you want it to soften a little bit, you get more of those. If you left it for five years, you get more kind of like dried fruits up front. And then, you know, you get this kind of like leathery, gamey characteristics coming through at the back end. But these guys have been doing it for gener fifth generation now, I think. And Dan, Dan, Danny is the, uh, the wine maker there. And it's vegan friendly. So uh, if a vegan comes along, it will shake their hand. Yeah. And then they can eat it with some kudu. <laughs> so I Could mean you? you're you're right. It's really there's really sort of upfront, almost jammy style fruit um, initially on the palate. It's still quite drying, isn't it? But chocolate mm. mocha richness. But I have to say, this is going to be a purely personal opinion mm. one because you just you look at the colour of these. The others are two vastly, vastly different wines. I think they are two absolutely beautiful wines. They are. If I had to put, if I had to put my finger on it, I think the Sinso might win out tonight out of these two wines because it's a little bit, it's getting a little bit warmer. If we did that, if we did this this at Christmas, that'd be the winner. Well, you know, we can't decide though what, what the winner is. Only the people at home can decide. I can tell you, it's split. It is really. Split. What are the tasting notes, Alex, on these two wines? So, um, the tasting notes for this one, we have... Um, for this one, that's helpful. Which one, which one is this one? Fine. Black currant, cherry... Okay. I think it's black Ke cherry. A bit of ketchup, so a bit of sweetness. Yeah. Beefy. I like beefy. I take beefy all day, every yeah, day. Yeah, you do get that little bit of... Like you said, you know, that, that gaminess. Gaminess, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I think the caramels are a very good one as well. Like caramelised onions, kind yeah, of thing. yeah, absolutely, but, oh. and and grippy tannins. You you do definitely get that structure. Oh, um, who, whoever put guns. grippy tannins in has worked out the poly V needs Switch. to have. Yeah, yeah, you need to put them together. It's too. You are a smart people. You get an extra point for and that. And what were people saying about wine number four, Alex? Can we go back to that poly no, V, or is that no, different? Oh, I can try it. Um, yeah, I'll go back to wine number four. I'll try. Please Sorry sure. to be difficult. I wouldn't know how to do it. Oh, Cherry, there we go. currants. Cherry cola. I'm probably hurting people who are entering their taste notes for five now. So I'm going to go back to five. Yeah. Sorry about that. Confected. I had to move my head. The camera's there and I thought it said infected. I'm like, that's not That's not good tasting. No, yeah, it so was confected. So that that very much comes from sort of the that rose, sweet the cherry, perfume, yeah, those me, dried, yeah. those kind of more dried fruit with that mm. little bit of sweetness. But I think that they're, they're absolutely wonderful. They're both wonderful great. wines. Two great wines. Personally, you know, obviously the Sanso is just amazing. It's 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 chalk and cheese. <laughs> <isn't> it? <laughs> it's not chalk and cheese. It's Sanso and Pinotage. If it was chalk and cheese, it would be the cheese. Obviously, well, it wouldn't Grommets. be the online wine tasting club, would it? Yeah, he's better over there. Isn't yeah, he? he's much better over there. Um, he's writing horrible things about me in the chat, isn't he? <laughs> But there we go. I'm just glad I'm being most. So, so how how are we how how are we doing for time? Because I'm um I'm I'm yabbering through. It's but about I, nine o'clock. So, so we, we should probably. Move so we should on. probably get six into the glass then, shouldn't we? We probably should. Um. So, wine number six. I, I'll let you do the honours of opening this. Um, wine number six is a wonderful story of a wonderful, wonderful person, and. What I have to say before we we go to this video is I could have sat and talked with her for probably about. 14 and a half hours about her journey what she's done the wine she makes 
And you can have these stories of history and heritage and groundbreaking winemaking and all that kind of stuff, and that's all well and good. But what's in the bottle has to be good. So yeah. this is this is Aslina um, Cabernet Sauvignon, and this is made by the first female black winemaker in South Africa. Absolutely so amazing. I you already ju- love you it. Just think what that means. Um, and she she took the time to hang out with me and talk for a little bit while about her history, where she went. And the fact that, you know, and you'll hear in the interview, she, she she went to school just to go to school and she didn't know she was going to do winemaking. She just wanted to go and learn. Mm. And the story about how it was taught in Afrikaans and had to get another tutor to learn English, absolutely phenomenal. But really down to earth, really cool. And more than anything, I hope you absolutely love the wine. So we'll pop the video on and we'll... Uh, come back and do some tasting notes at the end hi how are you good and you yeah very good i'm sorry i must have got the uh, the time difference wrong okay, okay. so um i'm from wazulu natal which is about two thousand kilometers from the western cape so that's where i grew up and then i came to the western cape through the scholarship from south african airways uh, to study winemaking uh, and when i basically when i was recruited from school to come and study winemaking i had no idea I had an idea that I'm going to study, but I had no idea what exactly wine was. So I was going to be studying wine, and I thought at that moment I was going to be studying how to make hunters and crossbow, uh, which when I got to the Western Cape, I realized those were ciders. Um, so I, I arrived, started attending classes, only to find the classes were in Afrikaans. Um, when I had an interview for the Basara, they did tell me that it was Afrikaans, but I underestimated what that meant. So I, I thought, well, I'm at school we've been learning in English and sometimes, you know, and then I thought Afrikaans, it shouldn't be that bad. But actually I didn't realize when I got to a student board that, no, it was really bad because I couldn't understand the word that was being said. So I had to try and get ways and means of understanding what was being said in class, learning what has been said. And to, on top of that, go outside and search what is wine and be in the industry so that I could learn and understand. So um, I worked part-time as a student at Delheim Wine where I learned about wines. And I actually, um, yeah, and then we got tutors to actually teach us um, about what winemaking was. And also after classes, when we've been taught in Africans to get to get someone who can teach you in English, so to make sure that you understand what you you were learning in class. So basically, that's what we that's what we did, and um, I finished my studies. That was in two thousand and three, and then I joined uh, Stelica Wines in two thousand and four. Started working as a winemaker there. That's how I ended up in the Western Cape. And then again, when I started working as a winemaker, I said I need to learn as much as possible and see. Um, Learn is like go from two different countries, see how they make the wines. What you know, what is it that triggers things that people talk about that that experience? People were talking about they'll talk about truffles, they'll talk about all these flavors and characters they pick up in wine, and you're like, where is that? And you're gonna look for it in the class, and you can't find it until I had to realize that actually, this is all about your your personal journey as as a uh, when you're tasting the wine, it's your own personal journey. It's your own uh, memory. It's the history of what you know that you're going to pick up in the class. Someone can tell you whatever they want to tell you, but you're going to pick up what you know in the class. You're going to literally trigger from your own memory. So it was, again, the, the, the journey, learning along the journey. Yes, yes, so that part of experimentation, that part of actually retrieving what you have on your memory and bringing that to the fourth. And so, so that those were things I learned. And then again, talking about food pairings and people will talk about the foods that I'll be like, what is that? You know, and then I started learning again. And then I realized when it comes to food pairing that, because I think as you, as you might know, black people were not that much exposed to wine, actually not exposed to wine at all. And so we're starting to learn about wine now. So people come and say, so now does it mean I must go by, look for this kind of food that people are talking about uh, to pair with my wines? And I'm like, no. I cook, my staple food is I do pap, 
I do chakalaka, which is made of beans and carrots and spices. I do um, pap is made of maize meal. I do dumplings uh, in curry sauce. I do, so as a, you take what you have and you play with it, with the wines you have. And that's when you can find what works for you. Because it's not about what works for the, what works for you at the end of the day. So I remember there was this one time um, when I was working at Selekai, people always said the mellow, it's going to go well with this and that. And then there was one day I made uh, chicken curry and I was eating it with pap. And then I remember I tasted it and then it, the, the curry brought that sweetness, a lot of fruits from the mellow. Immediately I called my colleague and I said, night, I said you won't believe what just happened. I said, for the first time I decided to say, people say, don't go for spicy food with the reds. And I was like, I made chicken curry using masala. And it is amazing. Like from, it, was, it was an eye opener. It was exciting. It was, I was like, this is it. This is it. And those were for me, the lessons along the way to say, actually, it's not about what is being said. It's about what do you think? Where, where do you think you fit in as a person? Create that space. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, absolutely. And there is, you know, but you, you look at the history of wine, there's a lot of people say, oh, this pairs with this, this pairs with that. But if you look at it globally, Italian food pairs with Italian wine and Spanish food pairs with Spanish wine a lot of the time because that's what it's always been. It, it's, it's grown up that way over generations and generations. Someone's not walked into to Italy and gone, oh, I'm going to create this new dish to go with the wine. So if you're growing great grapes in South Africa, you know, what goes together grows together is a phrase that people say. So you don't always need to try something different. Work out what you can make, what's local, what's phenomenal, and what the pairing is. And I think that's really exciting that, you know, a chicken curry and Merlot probably wouldn't be the first thing on most people's minds when they think about a wine pairing. But if it's good and it works, open it up, try it. And that's what I say to a lot of people with wine pairings is, it's very, very difficult to make the wine bad or the food bad. You know, yes. generally, yeah. if you've got good food and good wine, they're both going to be delicious. Will they be the perfect pairing? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, but try yeah. it. But if you try something different and go, wow, that's for me, and you've got your own new favorite pairing, that's wonderful. That's amazing. So, I, I can say, when you, when you talk about the different countries, and this is what I realized when I go to Italy, because um, I used to make Sangiovese um, when I was at Stelecai, and people always say, it goes all tomato based meals. And so it became a song that it goes with tomato based meals and it goes with mushroom sauces. And I got to Italy and I was like, that's staple food. It's tomato based stuff. No wonder such a food. Like it, it, it was trying to connect these dots with that. Oh, no wonder they say this goes with this. This it comes from here and automatically it's going to go with that. Fantastic. And, and what, what, what did you find for, uh, from traveling? What, what what did you bring back to your winemaking from being able to to travel abroad? Was it was it wine styles? Was it winemaking techniques that were were new to you, or a little bit of everything? It was a little bit of everything. I think um, getting to these different countries, there were a lot of things I was learning more. Actually, when you look on the front of the people, um, I think one of the things that I admire, I remember when I was in France, was their working styles in terms of harvest and understanding the humanity and harvest. When we're harvesting, which is exactly the same with California, you're eating a sandwich while you're running on the road. And, and in that space, they were making harvest a most enjoyable and the fun space. You're harvesting, crushing, working, but you all sit together and have lunch. Relax, chill. Let's, let's break the bread together. Again, I also learned in terms of realizing these, these, these places, all of them, that's why I was realizing and understanding the meaning of food pairing and what, what, why things go the way they go, why people choose things the way they choose them. And so that I understood that when I get back to South Africa, it's not really like trying to make a wine the way Bordeaux makes it, but it's to make a wine that is true South African. I'm a South African. I must make a wine that is South African. That's not trying to be anything, you know, to express your, your own environment. Okay, so actually, if you, if you can know that Stellenbosch is known for its care. Stellenbosch and Cabernet. So each region is known for specific wines, but at the same time, it doesn't mean they make bad wines on the other cultivars. 
we still make good of the other, but it's just known for that specific one. Uh, so when I was working at Stelekai, I made, I think, um, my, the cabinet, I, I was actually crowned woman when make of the year in 2009 with a cab. So every time I'd made a cab, it has been the cab. And yeah. it, for me, cabinet is one of the ones that I feel personally you can't go wrong with. I feel you can't go wrong with a cab. But also, I like blending. So this is where the other part comes in. I'm a fan of blending. So what I did is I got this Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, I used to blend, probably use Cap Franco, use Merlot, use whatever I wanted to use. And there was this one time where I tasted the Petit Vedor. Perception, Petit Vedor is like tannin, boldness, and color, and, you know, but I never... I hadn't associated it with fruit until one day I'm like, there is something in this thing. There's something in the petit vedor that actually we don't talk much about. We don't talk much about the fruits that you pick up on the petit vedor. And so I started playing with that. So from then I decided, okay, let me add a little bit of petit vedor in my cab and see. Okay. I played with that. And so it's got like 14% petit vedor. And, but what I like is like, you pick up these different fruits, these different flavors, but the interesting part of it is that every time I taste it, or I'll feel like, especially with the cap, I'll feel like I just want to take a bite into it. I feel like I want to take a bite into it. I'll have a glass and I'm like, I wasn't planning to cook, but I feel like, fortunately, I have to get something to eat. So it always just drives me to that angle, but I just love to take a bite on it. It's just give me that chewiness. But you're also doing, so lots of other people, bits and pieces so um you're on the board is it the pinotage youth development academy is that is that what's yeah. called? Um, and what, what's that all about because i think i think that's a really really fun project kind of very much into giving back to the community so the pinotage youth development academy what we are doing we're training young people through the value chain of the wine industry um we're slowly expanding obviously to other because of covid we've been forced to expand to other industries um but the focus has been actually just focusing on the industry because young people who are growing up around the wine industry they see the wine industry but they don't feel they belong they don't feel it's my space and you know uh, uh, understandably so because Black people were never part of the industry in, terms, in that space of saying, I'm going to go taste the wine. I'm going to go do that. So they feel like they don't belong there. But then we train them through that value chain to say, actually, you can change your life. You can get in here and work. You can get in here. And so it's, they're changing their life. They're changing their communities. But, and they're adding value to the society. So um, the students are between 18 to 25. And so once they qualify, we do job placement, they work at tasting rooms, they do tourism, they just get involved in, in the wider space. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you no, for your Absolute me. pleasure. Take care. Thank you very much. And we're back. Um, we really hope you enjoyed that. It was a, she's, she's quite the person, isn't she? Well, Merlot with chicken curry, quite the pairing. And it, it, it okay, shows yeah. what goes together grows together. And, you know, there, there's a whole bit in the middle that we were talking about around, um, you know, when, when you go when you go to Italy, you're not surprised that pizza and Sangiovese go together. But that, that's always gone together. Yeah, People yeah. don't go out there and create a new dish to go but, with the wine. Um, does, in South Africa, it, it's, it's all about them being... Say... being their own people and their own culture, their own food, and they make great wine and it goes together. But I think that's what she's put that unique perspective that she brings to it. That you know, that it's brilliant that you've got Americans coming in and making wine. Like Sam, Liz, uh, uh, Sam from Lismore Wines. She is one of our, my favourite winemakers in the world. She's coming from California. She's making great wines in South Africa, and that's really cool. But here are people who've got their own perspective. They've got the food that they like, which comes from the ingredients that grow there. That they cook, and that's home. It's, that's home. And so they make the things that work well together. So even with borrowed grapes, it's, it's that, that's, that is a glass of South Africa to me, and it is sensational. I'm really impressed. Um, but in the scheme of things, who doesn't have borrowed grapes? Yeah. By the time you look at Quite, them, yeah. We can go hours about root docks and transfer, and that came here and that yep. came there. Everything's global. Everything's a borrowed grape. Give or take, you know. There's That's someone's fair. going to be in the chat and go. There's one place in southern outer Mongolia that has this one kind of. Gra- no, I know. Actually, I get there's that. one place in South uh, South America which has got this. No, no. But Doesn't there is a guy matter. making single vineyard wines from like 400 year old tree. Gra- this in, is a vulca- in a volcano. 
look, no, there's um, there's cool things happening all around the world, but I think this is up there. This is cool. I think we've tasted some really cool wines tonight. I, I think the really important thing that we have to say about tonight is to judge a country yeah. on six wines is a bloody nightmare. It is. And there's so <laughs> many great things out there. You know, I, I know the guys at uh, Oliphantsburg who make phenomenal oh, yeah. gra- Grenache Blanc. You've talked about Sam again. And there's a new up-and-coming winemaker every day. But the big thing, you know, we, we, we have to say thank you to everyone who, who's helped us out with this. You know, we, we've got Catherine Marshall's jumped on. I talked with uh, Walker. We talked with Bruce. Uh, you know, we, we, yeah. got, we got this really, really small production stuff from here. Yeah. The guys from Capsich are in the chat. They've turned up to see what we're all about. Um they sent us a video over, which which was lovely. It was just we thought yeah. we'd tell the story, um, but you know it's great wine. And then we had the chat, you know, and it's going up on our YouTube Athena. channel. So everything's going to go up. So what you've got to remember with these wines is we're here. We're we're just passing on the story. These yeah. guys work day in day out to make these absolutely wonderful wines. If you like them, buy them because it supports a story. It supports a heritage. It supports a nation at the moment with things getting moved and then not being able to do something so if you can dive in and buy a little bit of south african that's great you know it's all it's all on our website it uh, is um, online, I, i'm going to attempt gonna put to the push the button up. to get the prices up i don't know if it's going to work because i'm looking at oh it worked so oh, we probably need to hide the poly v sorry on it thanks on caroline it. but <laughs> if you can see okay the yeah. prices here the value for money in these wines is phenomenal and yeah. even, even if we look at the sensor okay carol how many how many cases do they make 60 so 60, 60 cases. cases. Okay. P- things that make 60 cases. Screaming Eagle at £2,000 yeah. a bottle. You know, Tree see, Winery. At, <laughs> at, at, well, we don't even sell it. £2,000 a yeah. bottle. Class. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it just shows we can have these unique, elegant wines. You know, we've, we've only got a small amount of the Lone Wolf. It's kind of when it's gone, it's gone. But dive in. Support these people. They're making yeah. great wine at phenomenal value. And don't go. This is... There's a lot of places, and I, I get very passionate about this, because people tar it with a little brush on the side and go, this is really good yeah. for South Africa. No, it's, it's just it's really brilliant. damn good. You take uh, this Cabernet Sauvignon, and if you put that in Napa Valley, and it was 60 quid, you go, yeah, I'll buy that. Would that would be a bargain. If you bought this Pinotage, yeah. um, and I, I mean, because I, I know everyone's in the chat. Um, yeah, they, they've seen but, already, but I'm but, converted. But, that is bonkers No, but what good. I'm saying That's is almost so bordeaux Ian style. So I didn't want to compare yeah. peanut sauce board. But if that was a 60 quid Bordeaux, you'd go, yeah, I'll have a drop of that. But, but it's so different as well, still. It's it's not as... It's, it's his own it's style. It's not as so, confrontational as a so Bordeaux. So don't, 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 because it's South African, it should be a certain price. Wine is about the value of what's in the bottle. And what I would, what I want to do is, hopefully you've seen those prices and you go... Ooh, Holy yeah. moly, if that had been twice the price, I'd still be really happy. And, you know, all the winemakers, you know, I had the conversation and I'll put Walker's thing up. If you want to email them, give them a shout. They would love yeah. to share information with Go you, on tell Twitter, you more, you know. get on, talk yeah. to them. Seriously, wine Twitter is amazing. And you can ask a question directly to these incredible winemakers and they like getting asked difficult questions. They normally answer them. It's amazing. And if you notice, at the end of every video, we turn around and go, well... We'll come and see you uh, when we're allowed to yeah, travel. Yeah, that's what it's all about. If you're nice to them, you can come with us as well. Isn't that a great idea? And it turns out the next month we are actually going to go and see some winemakers because we are going travelling to, to the limits of where we can travel. England. England? Yeah. <laughs> we make one now. At least we can get out of... Out of Tring. <laughs> oh, yes. But yeah, we are, we're going to go and see... Tring is lovely, but we're going to go and see... Sorry, We've spent a bit of time here. Yeah. We are going to go and see some fabulous winemakers and we're going to talk to some of the real, you know, the people who've transformed the, the English wine industry from what was a bit of a sort of, you know, bloke growing some it's grapes wine. in the fields. And, oh, oh my God, we can make wine. It's got alcohol in it. To some really yeah, world-class wines. genuinely world-class wines. And the Discover Series one, we're taking three English wines and we're pitching them. Against no the holds counterparts barred, around, around the, the world. world. So we've and got... That is not easy because we don't make as much of it here. So yeah, anyone who's on our membership, that's what you'll be getting yeah. next month. Anyone who doesn't sign up, it's going to be brilliant. Get in. And if you do fancy taking a little step up into uh-huh. the adventurers, yeah. we are doing the best. I say the best of English. It may become best of British, but we're not quite sure yet. I yeah, don't but I have, I've heard they make some good Sauvignon in Elgin. 
Elgin, Elgin, wrong, you got the wrong out. That was today. Unless somebody knows, but we could go. There. No, Scotland, Elgin. Yeah, I know, but I've not, ta- I've not tasted it. But Apparently, we... Woodchester Valley. Woodchester's good. Woodchester yeah. Valley. That, yeah. so, uh, that, there's you... so many to choose from. Again, and that's some recommendations in the chat. Spirit. Where would Get you like to go and see us drinking? Ask her. Then I can tell my wife that yeah. people wanted me to go, to go drinking. Sorry, it's that, work. It's true. Sorry, I've got we're, to go. So we're, we're, we're definitely going to go to to Norfolk, which is one of the more surprising Norfolk, Essex. You wouldn't Don't give think it all about away. it. Don't give That's it all a cool away. part of the world. It's, we're yeah. we're going to go back to Kent, probably, aren't we? Yes, because Kent's cool, and that's where I come from. Yes, <laughs> and then and then I want to go July. July. 31 uh, days of German Riesling. Yeah. The crowd goes wild. Yeah. I, I don't know. What can I say? He loves his Riesling. It's, it, but it's anyway, the song back, back, back into the chat. Fa- favourites for the evening. Yeah. It's, it's really, really what So that, this is one back on five, the Poly V. One and six. One was <clears> way up there. Um, unsurprisingly, because everyone loves a Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah. And it's bright, fresh, it's crisp. It's, it's good. Great, great it's, wine it's to start your evening. Uh, five did really well, Jamie. Cool. Of course it should. But then six should. did really well as well. Was this, the, was this the wine, was this through the Poly V, or was this just comments in the chat? No, just comments in the oh, chat. Oh, okay. So I, th- I think the thing is, we look back at this, and I know we've probably overrun yeah. a little bit, so... If, Sorry. And I promise you, Alex hasn't got a song this week, so if you need to no, go, no feel free to go. Yeah. There's, if I told you there was a song, you would have gone half an hour ago anyway, yeah. so that's fine. <laughs> but each of these wines, and I've said it already, tells a story. It's got a place. They're all different. And it's not one is better than the no. other. It's just one what is you just what different like? to the other. What do you like? What's yeah. the story? Are you sat in a garden drinking? Are you having roast dinner? Are you doing yeah. this? Um, it's not often we sit sit and drink six wines back to back to back to back to back just by themselves it's about putting these wines into the real yeah. world and where they should be but we hope you've had a wonderful night I um, have I hope you had a wonderful time not listening to Alex and I'm, fine. I'm very <laughs> sorry that we put him back on so you could hear him again um, but you know we, we'll hang around for a few more minutes in the chat um, so if you've got Absolutely. any further questions we will uh, funnel them through the chat we'll stay around for a little while if you've got some more stuff um, but Unless you've got anything else to say, um, it's no, a thanks from me. Go to it's, South Africa it's, when it opens up again. Not, please not, get out there. Go to the vineyards. If you think Caroline was better, please put it in the chat. Um, <laughs> wow. You can say what you like. Um, <laughs> just, I was worse. But just whatever you know, I, I'm not leaving this chat. You don't get Alex and Caroline because I'm stuck here because I can't do producing or technical stuff. So I'm. I'm <laughs> I, I'm a, Neither I'm a, can I, apparently. I, I'm a one-trick pony in the corner. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> it's been, it's been lovely pleasure. spending time with you. And, um, Thank you. Tell your friends, and um, we look forward very much to seeing you next time. You can say it. You can say it. Roll credits. Oh, oh.